Forever Bristol City podcast. The final score at Ashton Gate on Wednesday night. It finished City nil, Ipswich Town won. Um, a spirited performance would be uh, my uh, outtake from the game. But I'm joined today by uh, regulars Mark and Ian. And I'm delighted as well to have on board uh, Dave Febbs. Morning, everybody. Uh, how are we feeling today? You first, Dave. Quick 30 seconds on how you saw it last night. Um, yeah, morning, morning, Dave. Morning, morning. The other two, two. Um, I, th- I think spirit is probably a pretty good description, Dave. I think we we gave it our all. We left everything on the pitch, and and I, I don't think over the ninety, there was a lot between the teams. And I think we could have easily, you know, come away with with a point. Um, I think Ipswich are a good side. Um, they play some really nice stuff, but I think we gave them a a, a, a lot of problems last night, and uh, I think you know. I think if we'd come away one or I don't think it'd have been massively unfair. I think they had a better first half, but we certainly had a better second half and we ended very, very strongly. Okay. Ian, your take on the game? I guess it's going to be broadly similar, yeah? Yeah, I thought we played about five times as well as we did against Coventry and came out came out with a defeat. And the reason for it and the stats bear it out is is just a lack of quality in the final third. Too many rush passes, too many uh, under hit, our passes either seem to be under hit or over hit. We just didn't seem to get it right, and we haven't got that creative player in midfield who's going to play the Brian Tinian type passes and play the clever little through balls. We just don't have that player in the squad. Um, and our other problem is, is although we crossed almost three times as many balls as Ipswich last night, there was a lack of quality on most of them. Mm. So, um, yeah, I don't think we could have done any more with the players available to us. And that brings us nicely back to the injury crisis that well, no doubt we'll talk about later well, we'll on. We'll talk about that most definitely. Uh, Mark, your uh, take on the game, and then I'll stick with you as well about that Ipswich Town lineup. So, your take on the game and that Ipswich Town lineup, they're up there with 12 games gone. So, it's a credible period of the season to judge them. And, you know, only uh, one defeat. But uh, your thoughts on the game and their team selection? I thought I I I uh, would agree with both uh, Dave and Ian. Um, City played far better than I expected after the Coventry game. We left everything on the pitch. The difference we were playing in, in a, a, an Ipswich Town side that was settled. Hardly any changes since the end of last season. Very comfortable uh, on the ball, passed the ball well and supported the man on the ball and defended defended excellently. They're just very fine margins. They you know, they they got players who can shoot from distance. Sometimes we, we want to walk the ball in. Uh, and it, sometimes it's it's decision making in the final third of the pitch, um, as much as as much as the finishing. You know, when when you when you got a chance to shoot it goal, and you, and the hesitancy kills the move stone dead. But that was one of the that was probably one of the best performances from City this season, and they lost. Uh, but uh, there's nothing to. It's just the injury. The injury problems are just so frustrating because you can expect to beat teams like that if you if you you know one of your best attacking players has to play right back, and you're making changes all over the pitch every week. Yeah. So it's becoming impossible. Uh, and with yet another injury, where we're really at a breaking point at the moment, it is, and it's it is, uh, it's it's frustrating. But there you go. But we did everything we could. Yeah, Dave, looking at our team selection, it does pick itself. I have to say, I think Sykes at right back, I think, I thought going into the last international break, he had a couple of really poor games, in my opinion, for what that's worth. But I thought Sykes at right back, he's he's looking good there. He offers more of an attacking threat than uh, than, than, than George Tanner. And we know if fit Ross McCrory would probably be first choice there. But talk about Sykes and the lineup. You agree with me? It picks itself just because of the paucity of the depth in the squad. There's not a lot of other options out there, are there? Um, you know, and that's that's part of the, the the problem at the moment. But yeah, I thought I thought Sykes, had, I thought he played well against Coventry. I think, or should I say, I think most of the team played well after the the opening 25 minutes, half an hour. I think we were all over the shop on Saturday, um, first half hour, but and we shouldn't ignore that. But I think if you take take the last hour and the 90 minutes last night, then, yeah, Sykes has, Sykes has played well. I think he, he offered us quite a bit there, to be honest. Would you have changed any of the front three at all or not? Not really. He said, I think he said pre-match, uh, 
I'm sticking with it at least 48 hours before the game. Um, I think there's. You could always say, yeah, I could. You could. You could change players up. I probably would prefer if Vyman played in a more central role, but I don't think those options are available to us at the moment with with who else we've got. I like to see maybe something different than Sam Bell at times as as well. Although you know he's he's he's, he's done okay, um, but I thought there there are too many games that Bell has where he's just not involved enough, and and I think we yeah. need to just think about that who you bring in you know Mehmeti is the the obvious answer there but doesn't seem to be getting many many minutes at, at the moment no. so it, it, it's difficult I think you know I don't think you'd sit here and say well yeah if I'd have picked player x over player y then we'd have won the game last night I think there no. you know, our our squad is generally bar some you know a few exceptions for quite of a, a level ability and that was the intention I guess going into the season was that we'd have a a slightly deeper, more even squad rather than have, you know, I guess the, the, the two difference makers that we've lost over the last uh, 10 months. Semenyo and Scott. Yeah. Semenyo and, Scott, and, and, you kind of... and Scott, yeah. Ian, you said before the game, let's quickly talk about injuries now, but, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's now gone up to 10 with Andy King being, uh, uh, being taken off uh, last night. Um, and Dave's just said about Bell being not as effective as he might be. What's Mametti got to do to get in the team? Should they start your boa? But just look at the shape of the side and your comments on the injury crisis while we're at this point. I don't like the shape of us up front. I think the 4 2 3 one or the, I don't know, what is it? A 4 2 one, three, um, isn't working uh, because we've got two guys out wide. Tommy Conway gets isolated. And I described it the other day as having Tom, Tommy up front without the service is a little bit like having a Rolls Royce engine in a lawnmower. Um, I don't think it, it, it isn't working. It doesn't look right. And Tommy's cutting a fairly frustrated figure. Would I bring in your boa? No, I wouldn't. Because um, I, I, I think, to be honest, he might be worth a try in his actual position, which once again is centre forward. Mm. He's not a right winger or a left winger. And you can see what Pearson thinks of Mametti last night because when Roberts was injured and he took Roberts off, um, so that could that's potentially 11 if he doesn't recover for Saturday. Um, he didn't bring Mametti on even though we were chasing a game. He brought a young um, left-sided defender on. So I, I, I really don't know. I think Mametti was going to be the maverick, the difference maker that he said he wanted. Uh, I, I the last few times I've seen him, he seems to have completely lost confidence and be a worse player than when he arrived. Yeah. So I mean, he's got to fall um, very quickly into the category of Sammy Smodix, Moisa, and Adam Luckin, isn't it? I mean, it's spending that seven hundred and fifty grand to a million quid and hope it works. And in those two cases, well, Smodix is tearing up trees for uh, Blackburn at the moment, but. We can't afford to be. We seem as though instead of spending two million, and that's the budget, we're two million on one player, and that's evidence with somebody like uh, Jason Knight. We still spend in a million quid here and there. Now, saying that last night, I thought Cornick, I thought he made a difference as he did when he came on against Coventry, closing them down. But you know, it's Mimetti has to be classified as a failure now, Ian, doesn't he? Just because oh, the manager, I, I don't think you can, I don't think you can classify the kid as a failure. It, it no, may be that that. We can't get the we can't get the best out of him. There's obviously a player in there, um, but it may be that we can't get the best out of him. Um, I I don't know. I mean, I'm not close enough to it. I don't see the kid train, uh, but he's on the bench every week, probably out of necessity. I would I would say um, Roberts is another one who, who hasn't looked great when he's come on. And there was a lot of talk last night about oh he's taking him off. Um, and and you know it, it it's it, it's a terrible thing. But when they asked Pearson, he said, "Well, he was injured. He was limping, so I took yeah. him off." But once again, Mametti didn't come on. So you you've either I look at doing something different, like uh, having a front two, and yeah. the only way you do that is is leave out. Um, I, I personally, at the moment, I'd leave out Andy Vyman and uh, use Knight slightly wider. Uh, I think you probably got to stick with Sam Bell on the left. I don't know who else we've got. Um, and uh, 
Okay. And and play if 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 he's fit, play uh, Naki Wells. Because well, he's, he's, he's not going to be fit this weekend. So well, hang on, Dave. No hang on. Oh, sorry. Wait a minute. Naki Pearson said when he's been interviewed, Naki is the closest one to being back for the Cardiff game. Right. Okay. That means he's going to play. I didn't hear that point. So if he's back, then then well, he, he obviously no, I'm not know. saying he is. We don't know. He's I'm back. saying Dave, Dave, what he's the closest. But no, let me finish and I'll shut up then. He's if he's fit, he plays up front with Tommy. Or Harry Cornick, if he wants to start Cornick and bring Tommy on from the bench. But I think we need that all of our forwards, our centre forwards, if you will, are better in a two than a one, okay. I think. So right. give them a chance in a two. We, you can't do any worse than lose, can you? No, true. Dave, what was your point? Then I'll come to you next month. Uh, I, I, I think it's just only a very quick point on, on Mometi in that I, I think when he signed, Sam Bell hadn't emerged, had he? Um, Sam Bell he had, was... Probably just making his well, it was that very Swansea early, game, early, Sam Bell, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, very in early, early games, left side of the field. I think in some ways that's that shaped the way it is. I think there was a, a thought that Mometi might might play central as well. Um, and but the kind of emergence of the four two one three or four one two three, depending on the, who were playing in midfield towards the end of the last season, has kind of has kind of and, and Bell's form. Which has generally been okay, even if I don't think he contributes enough during during games. You can see why he's ahead of Mometi at, at the moment, but I think Mometi is probably one of those players who needs some games, and that's that's yeah. the difficulty at the moment. All right, let's get into the games. action, Mark. Coming uh, to you. I mean, we had a bright we had a bright start, didn't we? Because Sam cut in with a shot. Tommy Conway had a header that you know he could he headed it straight at the goalkeeper. But it was a bright start by City before Ipswich got into their stride, wasn't it? Yeah, before that, I remember um, Cam Pring cutting on the left. You didn't see this on the highlights. Had a full-sighted goal and decided to cross it uh, with a goalkeeper in front of him. Mark Sykes did brilliantly. I think that's the most I've seen our full-backs attack in a game this season. It was great. We were prepared to go full throttle at times. Sometimes that leaves you open at the back. But Sykes, you know, cut back and put in a great cross to Conway, who probably was right on top of the ball, couldn't generate any power. But that was a fantastic chance. If he heads it either side of the goalkeeper, he's forced into a save. But it was a, a comfortable save from Blatsky. And that was uh, quite comfortable. Sam Bell's cut, cut in from the left onto his right foot, but it's a grass cutter, you know. He's made space, but there's no there's no power behind that shot, and it's straight down the goalkeeper's throat. But yet yeah, we started bright. We started brightly. A uh, good open game. Uh, so things look promising. Yeah, but we let them get back into it, didn't we, Mark? And you know, before we're talking each of you about the goal, uh, but just before that, um, Chaplin put in a shot that was adequately saved by Max. But then from Luongo, uh, that was a showboat save, wasn't it? When he touched it. Uh, around the post, yeah, it was good. It was going in the net. Well, he, but... yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say it was a showboat save. What he did was he got very strong hands to it and pushed that out of the way. Uh, I mean, if it, a showboat save would be probably doing what Basso used to do, fling himself to the right, save the ball, go down, and then smile at the cameras. And um, it was nothing like that at all. It was just good, strong hands to push it as far away from the goal as possible because you don't want a player following in and, and hitting it into an empty net. So that. That was good. But um, do you want to come on to the goal and I can give you my take I'll on that? Come on to the goal. Give your take on the goal. Then I'll come to each of you in turn on that. But over to you first, Mark. Go on. Go on. Yeah, we've got about three players on the side. Uh, Luongo's uh, flicked the ball to Hurst. Hurst, I think um, he's got Sykes behind him and plays what you might term textbook as a wall pass. He plays the ball back to uh, to Nathan Broadhead, who's got so much space. Jason Knight is tracking back so slowly, but there's this huge space between Jason Knight and if you see, if you watch it on uh, on the highlights, you'll see Taylor Garner Hickman in the other place. But Knight gives him no cover. There's this huge hole for Broadhead to run into. He hits a crisp shot. I, I thought it went that um, O'Leary from memory just rocked back on his heels, but he's hit it through through him. It's a very good shot, something we don't see our players do enough. Hit right through the ball. It's got pace and just beats him, beats him okay. in the near post, right. a bit near the middle of the goal, but it's an excellent finish. Poor yeah. defending, okay. though. Okay. Very poor I mean, defending. Mark, Mark, Mark's calling it an excellent finish, but Max was getting absolute pelters on 
social media last night and why I mentioned that say beforehand because at this level you know you're going to have a championship goalkeeper that's going to do some good saves but is prone to do one like that I mean how did you see the goal and do you pin it on Phillips uh, you know because that was a difference Phillips. between the two sides at the end of the day O'Leary you mean I wrote, I wrote <laughs> Phillips in my notes oh my god you know I wrote Phillips down that's the sort of thing that Flapper Phillips would do oh I saw you I thought you were looking at you're not looking yeah. at your electric razor are you Dave <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I'd actually written Phillips why, why have I got Steve Phillips why, why, is, he, why is he featured it's like two, we're at 2005 all again aren't <laughs> All day, all days don't come alone. I, I don't think anyone's going to sit here and say you, you, you expect the keeper to save them. Um, I, I think, as an explanation and, and not an excuse, if if anyone's watched much of Nathan Broadhead, they'll see that the way he strikes the ball, um, it reminds me a bit of Batistuta. He's got one. He's one of those people who can generate a lot of power for a very quick or short back lift and i think that's what does o'leary because he actually doesn't get set and it, and we're talking you know fractions of seconds here aren't we in terms of another player you see the foot go back you positioned yourself and it just he just hit it too he almost kind of hit it a bit like a top spin it dipped it a little bit in front of o'leary yeah he should have saved it i'm, I'm not i'm not going to sit here and suddenly reevaluate what i think of max o'leary as a goalkeeper on 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 one event over over a season, because I think generally he's 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 performed more than adequately for us. Um, um, yeah. yeah, it should save it, but he didn't, and and that's the goal that cost us the. You know, I'm not no, I'm not going to say it cost us the match. It didn't. It 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 was the deciding moment in 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 the game. Yeah, a game of fine margins. Ian, um, you know, Mark alluded to the amount of space that he had, and you could argue two of our better players involved there i mean again i can't, I can't re you, add anything you, to what you, you, said he, i thought he was i thought he was spot on and i thought max should have saved it simple as that yeah and the builder i mean hearse that was a player that was sort of i say linked to us he's that big striker mold who, who did they sign him for lester yeah it was it lester, yeah, lester? i think he's paul i think he's david hearse son isn't he uh, the ex Sheffield -Sheff right. Wednesday player, but he's a very he's a strong centre forward who leads the line very well. He gave Rob Dickey and Cameron Pring, uh, real you know, and sorry Andy King and, and and Rob Dickey, real problems last night. And and Pring had to contain him when he came inside uh, Pring's pace. But yeah, he, he with a four two three one, that's the sort of player you want there who can hold on to the ball with his back to goal, and then you bring those three players in. That was yeah. why they were so effective. He's a great leader of the line. Yeah, if we got out and got a player like Hurst with Tommy Conway alongside and either yeah. Vyman or Bell, yeah. well, then that starts to look decent, doesn't it? Because it's when, something different. If you... Sorry, you're talking to me, yeah? Yeah, still, still yeah. to you, Ian, yeah. Um, if you... Um, yeah, Hurst is what we haven't got. Uh, because he's, he's not just a head on the stick, he's a footballer as well. And... The, the at the start of the season, not just me, lots and lots of people on social media and uh, some of the comments we've had on there were saying the three players we were short of and then we thought we'd bring in once we sold Alex Scott was uh, a centre forward, the one that was different from what we've got, um, a creative midfield player and another centre back. Those were the three most popular choices of player, I would say. And we haven't got, uh, we haven't got any of those. Well, we've got them, and but you didn't, have to break, you didn't have to break the bank. You could have done, and this is a point Dave and I have talked offline about this. If they'd have gone out and spent six million, ignore wages because the wages these days we got all the high earners off. If we'd have bought three two million pound players for each of those positions, everybody would have been happy, wouldn't they? Well, the fan base they, would have. They thought, would, but we didn't. We didn't. We no, not, we didn't. We may not need to buy them. We could have. We could have loaned some of them. And that's something else that, all right, I know Taylor Gardner Rickman's alone, but it, the deal's done and we're going to buy him at the end of the season, it looks like. So the, the problem is, if you have, you can go with the two smaller guys up front, all right? But you, we could have Lionel Messi up front. It wouldn't make a blind, it wouldn't make much difference because we don't give him the ball. And if you, if you look at our, our service, in, I'll, I'll give you an example. This is, a few, this is from last night. 
Now, unusually for us, we pass the ball forward. Um, I'll just find it a sec. We pass the ball forward more than uh, more than they did, which is unusual for us. We don't. But when it comes down to a really, um, we cross the ball more than they did. But when it comes down to a really meaningful stat for me, is touches in the opposition box. And they had twice as many as us. All right. And, okay, and Dave, let me come to That's the one. issue. Let me ask Dave, you Dave, Dave, you're a numbers person. Give service to people. You, yeah, you gave a very good critique of our last review and what have you that, you know, we might make comments about certain players and individuals. But Ian's just given us some numbers there. They're facts, right? You know, more crosses than them, more forward passes than them, but fewer touches in the box. That doesn't correlate in my thinking. But then what's your take on that? I, th I think you need to dissect it further and, and look at what, what touches there were in the box. If there was a criticism for me last night was, although we defended well, we didn't clear our lines. And I think that there must have been first half, what I'd call kind of like four or five scrambles in the mm -hmm. box. You know, I, I don't know how, how many touches in the box were at Arian. Did Ipswich have, and how many did uh, City have? We had we had sixteen, and they had thirty-one. Yeah, I, I I bet you could probably put a dozen of those touches down into three or four scrambles. So you're getting multiple touches rather than multiple attacks per se. So I think there's was, always, was yeah, that because they got numbers. was that because they got more bodies in the box, uh, uh, Dave? They they seem to have um, you know. I, 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 some of that, I, I, I think, Mark, but I think I, the number of clearances we hit straight to people, I think there was, you know, um, I think it was Andy King kind of completely missed Scuff. it, a half volley clearance. He stumbled over the ball, didn't he, in the and, first half, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I think there's there's, there's all, always things like that. You know, you could, you know, just looking at Scout just then, we, we actually won the XG last night. We actually had, according to Scout, 1.02 and they had 0 0.96. You know, I'm not, you know, splitting airs on that. And I don't like using XG as a, that dictates what the result should be. Because once again, just going back to kind of goal mouth scrambles, you could have three 0 0.5 chances all happen within like five seconds of each other. Well, you can't score more than one yeah. one goal, can you? So, so we have to kind of temp, okay. temper that a little bit. I, I think I think they're a really good side, and I think that's what we should be focusing on. No, that's they, it. They've I got... mean, it was a good game. I mean, it was one of the Ipswich fans a good game of on here. It's an enjoyable game. Uh, two good footballing teams, and that's what Leeds said about us when we were up there the other day. And he said we had to dig deep in those last ten to fifteen minutes and grind it out. They were on. They were on the season. They were on their arses. I know Ben and Tom aren't getting the service, but I feel they need to do better. Bell making runs alongside defenders and struggle, Conway struggling to hold it up needs improving. And Ross Edwards has said, we've been mediocre for decades. When was the last time we had a top, top manager? I don't think we have. Ian's right. You can't make a silk purse out of the sows here. Mark, let me just come to you on the final two incidents I've got noted uh, on the first half. Uh, I've got Taylor Gardner-Hickman, tidy performance from him in midfield. And he put in a shot. He looked like he'd over, overdone it right at the end of the first half and uh, keep it tipped it over. But your, your thoughts on Taylor? I thought Taylor's a, a great passer of the ball and, and that's why he's in, in, in central midfield. He's very good at picking play, picking players out. I hope, you know, he, find, we, he finds his position there and he, he's not going to be a utility player that's going to play all over the place. But yeah, he's coming from the left-hand side. He's taken three players out. There's a fourth player uh, on the left side of their area and he hits the ball early. It's climbing, loses power as it goes to the top left-hand corner and Vladky makes a decent save. I wouldn't say it's a top-class save. Gets his hand, is going in the top corner and and, fl and flicks it over. But yeah, that was our best, our best chance of the night, uh, a Apart from Con apart from Conway's uh, soft header, so yeah, great, great from Hickman, and I think um, he's a quality passer of the ball, and somebody I hope will feature regularly in central midfield. I think he can tackle, and I think he can play better than Joe Williams. So uh, hopefully, he'll be a regular yeah. fixture now. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, Ian Morsey, uh, <laughs> just before the interval, Max not Phillips rooted to his line as the ball thundered off the post. I mean, Morsi and is it Connor Chaplin? They're two players that would walk into our side and possibly make that difference to us. Would you agree with that, Ian? And that was a cracking shot, wasn't it? Again, too much space, though. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just a little bit like if you took the first 25 minutes of Coventry, how good did they look when they had so much space in time and we let them play? 
as soon as Jason Knight came on the field, or and we switched to a formation that we could actually play, they didn't look so hot, and they got beat last night by by Coventry, uh, by Rotherham two 0 So it it's a question of yeah, it, excellent shot, struck it brilliantly. Uh, unlucky not to score, and you wouldn't say if it had been in the top corner, you wouldn't have saved that with two goalkeepers. So, yeah, one of those things. Coventry at the Woodwork three times on Saturday. It's okay saying well they only had one shot on target, but they, in fairness to them, they did hit the Woodwork three times as well, and could have been three or four up in that first twenty-five minutes. So, um, yeah, I, I thought. But then again, you come back to Sam Morsi, and you, you, you Egyptian. Um, you look at his career. Was he ex part? Did they sign him from Barnsley? Was Wigan, no, they, think, wasn't it? Uh, Morsi. Uh, I think they signed Wigan. Wigan, I think. Wigan. Wigan, Wigan. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he's, yeah. he's 32 years old now. He's not He's not a young player, but he's he's a solid central midfield player. He's played around, he's played around League One and the Championship and is a dependent dependable player he, you know he was there last season as well um so you know they've 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 got a very settled squad but yeah i mean i mean you looked at some you know the last few games that in the championship you've got to take half chances haven't you uh you look at the stoke the stoke and birmingham goals with those headers that came straight back and are whacked in against plymouth uh it, it two nil up they get half chance on the edge of the area and you know, she for for Coventry and Godden, those can go. Those can go in because you know you got when you've got well drilled defences, you've got to take your half chances. It's not the clear cut ones. It's the half chances like that that win games a lot of the time. Yeah. So you need that. You need that in your locker. And we we haven't got anybody that can strike the ball like that. I don't think. No, no. Wish we had the Alan Walsh when he used to stride through and just. Belt it, those daisy cutters. OK, Dave, into the second half, they're attacking. I really can't stand seeing 3,000 away fans behind one goal because they really, I thought they made quite a bit of noise last night, more than Coventry, to be honest, although some people said said not. And we were quite subdued, I thought, our fans. But right at the start of the second half, again, Max has been getting pelters for letting the ball go through him. But after uh, King um, stumbled, Davis got through. That was a good save by Max, wasn't it? He got down to his left and touched it around the post. Yeah, that could have been two nil easily, couldn't it? Yeah, it was a really good save. Um, strong, strong hand kind of shot that's dipping on him again. Uh, but just that probably extra split second to be able to get himself positioned. Um, yeah, it was a, it was a really good save. I guess a, cr a pretty crucial save, or we hoped it would be a crucial save. We were still, we were still in it. Yeah. We're still in it. Ian, how did you rate Tommy's performance last night? And he had he had a shot. This is the start of the second half. He had a shot saved. They was brought down. Well, it could, must have been a foot inside the bo outside the box. But Tommy's performance, and then a well struck free kick from him. I thought uh, Tommy's performance, no service. He's not a back to goal striker, um, and we have got this terrible habit of lumping the ball forward in the air. Uh, now that's okay if you're chipping it over the top or you're playing a through ball but we aren't they're just uh for want of a better word punts so um tommy isn't he isn't getting the service i don't think that uh the one role being the one in a four two three one suits his game he'd be better off if naki was playing next to him or harry cornick but and i think i'd say the same for all our strikers they're better in a two than a one. And we've got to find some way of being able to do that. Now, we know it's not three five two 5 with, with the current personnel. We could probably play that formation with if if we had a fully fit squad. And the fully fit squad is never going to happen. We, we That's a known risk because it's been that way for the last three or four seasons. So on, the, on that basis, the back four seems to suit us having three in midfield seems to suit us but we need to find a way of playing with two strikers because what happens is all of our forwards when they get the ball get isolated because they're not getting the ball played in behind so they can utilize their pace one thing they can all do is run when we've got sykes on the right and he's not playing right back um you know we've got uh bell who's who's quickish we've got tommy who's quickish 
But but with Tommy, he's got good movement as well. But you need somebody in midfield who can find him when he makes well, a quicker run. pass. I think is is the term, isn't it? Yeah. But yeah. Um, well, you need somebody with that what they, you know spatial awareness or whatever they call it these days. But he's got that movement. He's got that degree. Of, a lot of the lads that come through the academy have got that because they're coached to move that way in a, at a very young age. But you still need someone to give them the ball. And if you've got somebody like, for example, Naismith in midfield, he can do that. Um, not always, but on occasions. Now, we haven't really got anybody else who can give them the ball on the ball, facing goal with a, a right amount of space. So I think until we change that basic concept, uh, I can't see a, a, a where, where a huge improvement is coming from. I hope I'm wrong, but I just can't see it. OK, um, Dave, the substitutions coming with 20 minutes remaining, I thought they were well-timed and they contributed to a very strong finish for us. And they were the, the obvious ones to make, really. Uh, Cornick and Yeboa coming on for Vyman and uh, Bell. Now, I was told the other day that I was effing clueless, describing... Uh, Andy Vyman is an out of control speedboat who just waves and points his arms all over the place. The out of control speedboat, Chris Honor, I thank for that one, and I think it's quite apt. I thought he had an abysmal game last night. Myself, um, Cornick and Yaboa came on. What do you? What did you think of Andy's performance and you know the substitutions and those players' contribution? Um, I think I think Vyman did have a did have a poor game last night, but. I, I think going back to my comments on Max, what we should be doing, is, or we, it's absolutely fine to evaluate someone's one-game performance, but let's not then tar the whole of his time with Bristol City by by one performance, because Andy Vyman's been a really good player for us, and I think Chris, you know, is is good at championing um, phrases that are probably a bit unfair, to be honest. You know, yeah. You know, people talk about Andy Vyman running around a lot and doing nothing. Well, he doesn't do that, does he? He runs around a lot for purpose, and 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 you know, and to create space for others. And to just say he runs around is 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 a is a poor comment to make. You know, I think Chris was the guy who did the um, was it busted trampoline for Famara Zizou. You know, <laughs> uh, and and I think these kind of things stick, and and therefore it, it, it builds bias in people's opinions about Andy Vyman. You know, Andy, Andy Vyman scored, has he scored 50 goals for us? Yes, his next goal, I think, is his 50th in 200 appearances, yeah? So if you take... Yeah. But, but you know, he's played he's played 200 games for us. But he hasn't played, you know, people say, oh, he's only scored one in four, that's rubbish. Well, he's not played as a striker, has he, for more than about 60 or 70 games out of that. Yeah. He's played as a secondary striker, he's played right wing, he's played right wing back. So I, I, I think... You know, let's not tar Andy Vyman's okay. whole career yeah, he, here he, over he, one he performance last a, night. Like, but, he but he was a more... whipping boy, and look, we all have our, you know, comments like that. Yeah, come to you next year. And comments like that are shock jock type comments from that perspective. I mean, 200 appearances, 50 goals. You know, if you take out almost half those goals came in one season, he's not captured that form of 21, 22. And I don't think he ever will again. And but that's because of a. That's because of a specific way. I know he was because he was part of WSM. That was a striking. He was played in a trio that played as a unit, which, as others, Ian and in particular, has just said on here, we don't play as a unit up front. But all right, he's out of contract in the summer, Dave, isn't he, Andy Vyman? Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, supposedly. I, I did. I can't remember who said something. Someone said he might have actually triggered a, an extra year during the okay. the um, okay. twenty one twenty two season. Your, your take. You had your hand up just then. It's where he plays. I mean, a point that Dave made. I mean, I've seen Andy Vyman play right wing back, left wing back. Uh, his best position was a 10, more or less, behind Martin and Semenyo. And some, they're both gone. We haven't got a player like Semenyo with the strength and the power that can come in from the wide areas that can uh, turn players. Uh, we haven't got that player. Tom is certainly not that player. He's a, he's a good player, but he's different. Andy Vyman had a great season for us, and you don't get all those goals and all those assists in one season if you can't play, and if you're just running around. But when he—that's when he's good. When he's bad, um, he does do the arm waving and the, the pointing. You know, I screamed at him a few times on Saturday. Don't wave your arms; just go and mark the bloke. Yeah. Um, and he's—he's he's, you know a bit like the cop directing traffic. 
if and that's the downside of his game but i still think if he's being played in that flat three i'll call it or last night was more of a right wing ish type of position yeah. that I, that's I mean, not that's his the best thing. position. Play him down the middle, and that's where he was. Yeah. That's where he this is what happens when you when you you've got so many injuries. And I mean, if if you if you look at the injuries, just to bring it into the conversation, Pearson, when he was talking about his uh, and uh, his uh, back back four, you were he was looking at McCrory as a right back, Zach Viner as the right centre back, then you've got Rob Atkinson possibly. As a left centre back and can bring well, three of them couldn't play last night. So you had Andy King, who's played in midfield the vast majority of his career out of position. Campering finished up out of position. It's all right saying, well, he can play there. His best position is left back, right? And he can play there. So yeah. this is the and Vyman on the right is the same. It's that type of thing that you get when you can't keep your players fit for whatever reason. I don't pro profess to understand it or have a solution. Um, apart from having a slightly bigger squad, um, and it, it, it's that it's that difficulty that you get. So you what you do get, and this has, has been a criticism over in the past, the square pegs in round holes yeah. argument. Okay, but I still think it's down to the players around him because if you'd have taken any of us as very very average players and put us into the very best Barcelona side for ten minutes, we'd have looked all right. Because there are there are brilliant, brilliant players all around you. Yeah, we haven't got that, and Andy hasn't got that at the moment, and neither of the other players as well. So we're we're getting by as best we can with we're what we're getting by. I think that's the key. I think that's the, the key only point. thing open to us is free agents. Yeah, that's okay. the only um, thing we just can to bring put a bit in context on Andy Vyman's numbers. Yeah, because as you say, it's one in four. But if you take out the season when he scored. All those goals, right? All those yeah, goals. Yeah, but why, why would you do that? Huh? No, I'm why just would saying you do that? overall because and that season was not that season when he scored all those goals was his golden boot season in his whole career. Because if you take that season out, the other 160 games that he's played for Bristol City have yielded 25 goals. That's one in seven, as near as damn it. So he was great that season, right? But that was a one off for him, you know, we can't talk about the past we've got to talk about the present and the future mark just to wrap up uh the action on wednesday night um harry cornick he's got a lot of critics on here i mean i don't think we've been people say we, we've beaten up andy vyman i don't think we've been massively critical of harry cornick and i thought he had a cracking uh, 20 minutes or 26 with the time added on and that shot of his that uh, hit the post hit the keepers back um before being cleared by brandon williams lone player from manchester united that was that was we were worthy of if that had gone in we'd have been worthy of the point but what did you think of harry last night i think it was a great substitute appearance and i think the thing with harry is can he do that for the whole game the only game i can remember him uh playing a whole match where he, he was effective was against middlesbrough and bank holiday 2-2 draw at ashton gate last season but he was excellent when he came on. Harrod defenders, and he's won that. He's won that ball in their area, and he's going away from goal. So he's turned and hit it with his left foot as best he can. It's hit the base of the. It's hit the post. Hit the back of Vladky, and it's just rolled agonisingly along you know, the line, the and it's cleared out. Ball, the last time I saw roll a ball roll along a line like that, it was mm. that same end of the ground. It was Alan Walsh against Forrest. In the 1989 League Cup semi-final, do you? I think all of us were there. Well, it was like that. Yeah, that was okay. different. That was that pitch was like was it, pitch it was, was like the memorial. It, it was, was like the memorial like the memorial stadium. Or yeah, it was like it, it was just it was like a glue a glue plot. This one, um, I mean, Tommy's running in, but the defenders the defenders got there first. I think um, your bow is slightly to the left to try and get it, but it, it, it it's cleared it's cleared away from him. And um, you listen to the um, the summary, and uh, and um, Christian uh, Honor, Chris Honor sounds like he's in pain uh, when he's coming. Oh, 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 oh! But yeah, come. I mean, uh, 
when Cornet came on, that was an excellent, you could say, a cameo, a cameo role. Can he do that for the whole game? But well, I think he's the best. He's the, he's, he's, the, he's the best. He's the best we've got. I think who could who could lead the line. The only problem is, I wonder about his ability to hold to hold the ball up. I think we'd be better off with a four, three, one, two. Him and Tommy with somebody in behind. Even if it was, even if it was Andy. If we, I, I don't know if we go the whole hog and do that. Andy playing in a, in, a, in a three behind. He's he's much better down the middle, arriving late, and he's a finisher. He'd been a, the reason he scored so many goals in that season two seasons ago. Fox in the box, and he's a he's a finisher. He's mm. just nowhere near the action. You know, he's like he's outside. He's he's outside the door all the time. He's 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 nowhere near. Yeah. Uh, he's so he's so isolated. He doesn't get involved. But that season, he was uh, scoring all those goals. He was, you know, he was arriving late on the ball, and he was a, he's a finisher. That that was the beauty of Andy Vyman. But yeah, I play Cornick in a two. I think with Conway, it would benefit them both. Then, right. uh, okay. but would 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 um, Nigel uh, want to do that? I, d- I don't know. He might, well, you know, he, prefer- he seems to prefer to have two two midfield midfield players in front of the back four, effectively having six defenders when we're defending. I, su- uh, su- I suppose so. Yeah. One of those two can't, go- you know, one of those two goes forward, uh, probably being Taylor Garner Hitman. So well, I, d- well, I don't know, but that would be th- that. I would do that. Nigel probably wouldn't. Dave, um, the the shot it was unfortunate, and say the ball rolled along the line. The other guy who came on the sub, Ephraim Yaboa, he wouldn't be anywhere near the first team had we not got the injury crisis. He's getting a lot of minutes out there, and the one thing I noticed about him is that he's he's very quickly to press on players. He made them think about what they were doing. He gives away silly fouls, a bit like Antoine Semenya when he came there, and he just needs to calm it down a little bit but what did you think of your boa last night um i, I don't have much more to add to what you said he's, he's 17 and he's raw and i think you know the, and he's learned his game in the harshest environment out there first team football in the, in the championship and I, I think it's as you say he's getting minutes because of you know we're, we're struggling with injuries and we've probably got some players who perhaps we thought would have started over him or played ahead of him like Mehmeti used for whatever reason isn't 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 getting his, his opportunity. I just want to just go back on on Mark's comment as well. I'm I'm and I guess Ian's earlier as well. I, I like strike pairings. I think Nigel Pearson's you know has said in the past he likes playing two up top with one in behind. Um and I think what Mark suggests the four three one two is you know, and this is not a criticism mark at all because it's probably something I, I'd say as well. It, it's the football manager uh, solution in that we, we stick magnetic blobs on a board and, you know, and, and that's what we end up with. And, but I think that the, the other side to that is how, how does that work when we haven't got the ball? And how does, you know, if we're typically playing against teams that are playing back four, how do our front two split their four and we saw last night even with you know a front three we still can't press enough to to stop teams not necessarily playing out because i think we did an adequate job of it but we saw on saturday against coventry that with your two central that the easy bit was for their and they played a back three coventry was for their side centre backs to advance the ball, or at least get outside of our strikers, and then have easy passes into the into the wing backs. So, it's there's pros and cons of of of, every, of, of all of these things. As, as you'll know, I'm not a believer that formations solve problems. They they can do, but I don't think they're the be all and end all. And I think we're suffering at the moment from lack of lack of players and and lack of players to be able to start well and 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 change games as well yeah. you know it's it's he's, he's quite limited in what what he's got and i guess he is, yeah, yeah. We, we might come on to this in a minute about why why price. that is yeah ian let's uh roll it on and uh, we want to wrap up inside the next uh inside 10 minutes uh rolling on to cardiff yeah seven side derby um you know they got a thumping four nil win at huddersfield on the uh, on tuesday night i think it was so they've had an extra day to uh, recover. I mean, 
we don't know what the lineup's going to be because we don't know if Andy King's fit. But, you know, Cardiff, it's not going to be easy over there on Saturday, is it? They're on a bit of form at the moment. They won 4 0 the other night, Huddersfield. They've got a lively uh, front four uh, that we've had problems with in the past. Uh, not not when they were at Cardiff, I hasten to add, but um, uh, we, when they've been with other teams. That's that mate um, you're referring to, particularly, isn't it? The Reading up, up front. But it's um, what I do personally, if, if let's assume Andy King's not going to make it. I give a debut at centre back to uh, Jamie Knight Lebel on the right. Shift Rob Dickey to the left. Play Campering in his best position. Let Mark Sykes continue <laughs> it right back. I don't see we've got much of an alternative. We, I mean, Harry Leeson would have been an alternative, but he's gone out on loan. Um, you you can't change much uh, in midfield with James Gardner Hickman. I play uh, Knight in front of Sykes uh, and Sam Bell on the left. Once again, I don't think we've got an alternative. And if Naki's fit, I'd go uh, Conway Naki up front. If he's not fit, I'd go Conway Cornet and see how that goes. OK. Um, uh, and I think defensively, we've been pretty good. We're not conceding loads and loads of goals, okay. but we're only the 18th highest scorers. Uh, so we're, uh, we're that, uh, I don't say a draw specialist, but... We're the team that's not going to score a lot, and we have to win games by the odd goal. Um, so I'd like to see us become more of a, if you would, if you would call it a three-two team, rather than a one-nil or a, a possibly two-one team. And I think we've got to get our best players, available players, on the field. Um, Naki and Tommy play well together when they've uh, been in formations where that's worked before, but not with either of them wide. So let, let's go over there and have a go because I think if we if we play a similar team, um, I, I I don't think we'll get thrashed, but I don't think we'll um, we'll get the win either. And, right. and I want to go in. I I, I want to go and try and win games. I'd much rather, uh, you know, win one, lose one, draw one, than you know just sit in there and draw three. Yeah. Okay. So. Right. That, that's that's what I do. Yeah. But, I, no, mean, but I mean, look, it's, it'd be not, just if, me. we get, if we were to go over there and win, then the batch of three games, it works out at six points if we go there and win. And that's two points a game, which is enough to keep us up there challenging. And then, dare I say it, you know, the next two games are games that we bloody well ought to win, being Sheffield Wednesday at home and... Um, and yeah, but Dave, uh, Dave, how, how many times have we said that over I know, the years? I know, I know, I know, I know. Mark, quick thought. I want to ask Dave one question afterwards because we haven't we heard from you, Mark, uh, and, and obviously Ian on uh, 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 the weekend about Nigel and the general situation at the club. But Mark, any quick thoughts from you on uh, on um, Cardiff uh, away? A three o'clock kickoff on a Saturday is unusual for a start, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, for some reason, I thought the game was on a Sunday. I don't know why I did that. I think we, I think we're going to be more comfortable playing away if we don't have, if we don't have the majority of possession. I'll be happy. Um, I think our 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 play lends itself to counter attack in football because we got we got pace in behind, and uh, ordinarily, I'd say we could we could win the game. But with the injuries, you know, with the likes of Sykes having to play right back. You know, and and uh, and we're we're struggling now uh, with with the centre back role. I don't think King. There's no way King's going to be ready if he's feeling his hamstring. He won't. Yeah. He won't be risked. You know, you don't want to tear, which means he could be out for two or three months. Yeah. So uh, that means another another shuffle, shuffle around. And I would, yeah, I would rather play a specialist centre back there and play Pring left back than than uh, yeah. have to play um, Hayden it. Roberts. Uh, yeah. But Duncan I think we got. I think I, I would like to say. I, I I like to say let's go for let's go for three points, but who knows? And let's have Duncan Idahan bingo. It's taken forty nine minutes of the podcast because Duncan Idahan could play on that left side as well. So, but he doesn't seem allegedly to have allegedly been playing very well for the under twenty ones. Yeah, well. there we go. Hence, okay, hence Dave, why Nigel um, brought him in. I we, guess we haven't we haven't had you on for a few weeks, and there's a lot been happening off the pitch. Um, <coughs> Nigel's comments, he seems to have sort of rectified it by saying he's had talks this week um the lack of communication from the top i mean 
you, you're you have a measured response in everything that you do, Dave. But you've been sort of quite subtly critical of the hierarchy. What's your overall take on the financial situation? And does it need to be not the financial situation, the Nigel situation? Does it need to be resolved before we go into the next transfer window? Um, ideally, yes. Um, I think you know you've probably seen lots of stuff that I, I've posted on OTIB. You've probably heard me on Radio Bristol on, on Monday night as well. The problem is, as fans, we're not being communicated to. Or, in fact, that's a lie. The only person who's given us any communication is Nigel Pearson. And yeah. I think that's appalling. And I say, you, you're right, I'm, I'm normally quite quite kind of grey on the, on the football side of things because I think, you know, football is rarely black and white. But I think yeah. on, on, on the other stuff, we, you know, we're making it black and white out of speculation because none of us know what the hell is going on. We're hearing sound bites from Nigel Pearson. But I think what this is re what has really happened over the last few months is contradiction. And and if, if I kind of explain those those sequence of events, we've gone into a summer thinking that, you know, comes from Brian Tinney and can't remember who else that, you know, we've got a plan A and a plan B. Well that's been contradicted. We've then we we've, we've heard from Steve Lansdowne previously what football makes football can spend. Okay, you could qualify that and say football tends to lose money every season whether you sell players or not but you know let's just kind of take that as a view that he's previously been prepared to offset the losses and for me that's that's what I've always deemed him to be saying running a sustainable club that we're not getting ourselves further and further into debt like we were in you know losses and and fighting FFP like we were under the previous regime so we've had that that kind of contradiction because now we've sold someone for twenty five million. The, the likelihood is this this season we're actually going to make a profit. So wh where does that fit against the, the previous comments? Then we've heard him on Guernsey radio um, or podcast talking about his golf course. But um, there was a bit in there about you know, I guess Steve's ego around. Um, you know, I, I did the Alex Scott deal. Well, yeah, he probably did. He probably signs off on everything over a certain value. So, yeah. you know, what what what's new there? And and you know, and, and that's not, you know, to disparage Phil Alexander as well. You know, if you've got someone bidding twenty million, the owner who puts in X million every year is probably going to sign off on it. So, I, I don't think that was necessary. And then he came out with his crass comments about Nest Egg. He came out with crass comments about Luton. You know, and this is where I I kind of get into the view of. Steve Lansdowne and the ownership, you know, and that includes John as well, are focused on outcomes. And this is where I do get kind of quite black and white on it. They're not interested in process. They're a bit like a magpie. Oh, there's a new shiny object over there. We want that. They've got no consideration of, you know, how that magpie built his nest. And, and I think this is, you know, goes back to your, your Swansea model, your Brighton models, your Brentford models, Brentford your model. now Luton models. He's not interested in the fact that it's taken Luton, you know, X years to build that. He's not interested that they've predominantly done that on probably the best recruitment outside of Brentford that we've seen in the EFL. You know, and when we compare it to, you know, our recruitment over the years, it's chalk and cheese. We ain't world class, no matter what, you know, Mark Ashton might have said when he was here. So there's lots of things coming here that kind of start to build a picture of we're not being run very well. Or we're certainly yeah. not being, you know, run as well as we think we 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 it's are. On that and basis. Ultimate, and sorry, Dave, just yeah. to finish off on that. And then, you know, and then then when Alex Scott gets sold, and you get Phil Alexander coming out, and I'm my my view is, and I might be completely wide of the mark, is that Phil Alexander was told what to say, and he retrofitted what he said in that sound of the city to kind of fit a rhetoric of, oh, yeah, well, budgets were agreed in March and all that. And I think ultimately that's why he's ended up going because he's probably disagreed with the way the football club side of things are, are going. And Nigel Pearson is bearing a brunt. And, and I think yeah. it's pretty awful, if I'm being honest. OK, Dave, and on that point, just to pick up on that point, do you think all the things you said about getting us away, God, he's got the wages down, la, 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 he's brought youngsters in, you know, in a way that no other manager in recent years has done, do you think he needs to be shown a little bit of respect for what he's done 
and that is evidenced by something happening before i say yeah. by christmas yeah yeah I, I did some some maths yesterday I, had we carried on spending at the levels we were we'd have spent 49.3 million more by my estimates so so nigel pearson has cut costs and that's wage bill and amortization i've done other costs because i don't know what what makes up those 49 million he's he spent less in his and that's estimating what he's going to spend this year so in his in his three seasons here he's also brought in 35 million pounds of, of transfer revenue as, as well you know i i i don't know what else he could he can do i you know i'm a big fan of nigel pearson do i think he's perfect no i don't i think there's lots of things that you know i would do differently you do differently the two other guys on the pod would would do differently that doesn't necessarily mean that we're right and he's wrong either but I think he's just got his, his hands have been more and more tied behind his back than ever. You know, we actually heard him midweek probably for the first time him actually go away from his comment of, you know, I like to work with a small squad. He said we could probably do with two or three more players in our current state. And I think that's the, the crux of it really is I think he was, he was hoping to keep Alex Scott, whether that's, you know, blind faith or not, I, I don't know, but I, I think he fully expected to be able to go and, bring some players in to bolster the, the the squad and i think we know we hear lots of stuff around we you know we'll only buy players if they're better well i think you have to take a little look and say which players are they trying to be better than them and, and i think if we look at someone like harry cornick I, I honestly think he was there to be better than chris martin he wasn't there to be better than harry cornick uh so antoine semenyo yeah. and 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 you know we pay 300 grand for the guy we okay we the, you know we we're all talk about you know loans i'm not against them i kind of see the pros and cons of them but if our wage budget is at its max you can't even bring in a loan so what you know i don't see us doing anything in january you know no. let alone perhaps making right. taylor gardner hickman permanent all so right. we can have Dave, one more that's game great. Against i think West anybody Brooklyn. what you just said over that last three or four minutes has been uh you know absolutely brilliant said you know i know i tend to shriek off with my views just quick one from you ian before we go because we do need to wrap it up you raised your hand was there one particular point you wanted to pick up with uh, with dave I, I, it alludes it comes back to the point of on communication what we need to know is is what the strategy is what was nigel pearson's job when he came in all right so if nigel pearson's job was look we're not going to give you any money we're going to cut the wage bill right you know that so this is where what you're coming into so come in with your eyes wide open um if we sell players you'll only be given a fraction of money and it'll be this percentage all right so if you sell 35 million you're going to get 10 percent. that's three and a half million quid which i think is about what we've spent roughly now bearing in mind we've got uh in the summer i'm talking about not not the not including the january ones as well mametti and cornick but like dave said they weren't a huge amount of money so and 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 on on top of it they're not better than what was already here um um so we need to that so the strategy is that nigel pearson's job all it's been is to keep us in the championship now if that was it he succeeded because everybody seems to want to take credit for cutting this wage bill from Richard Gould, Parkinson, Steve Lansdowne, John Lansdowne. Who's it down to? But is it Brian Tinian? So no. who, it, it's down to whoever sets the budget and all the budgets are signed off by Stephen Lansdowne because he's funding it or he has been funding it. Yeah. Now, I think the big difference, if you look at when we had Mark Ashton, um, as my my dad used to say spending money like a man with no hands you your budget uh he, he he's he's done all that he's bought he's done callas now i know all that was all pre-pandemic so um the the pandemic thing right so but mark ashton has spent he spent he spent he spent he hasn't done that at ipswich he spent a little bit or he spent a bit more in league one to get the squad together they've got to get them out of it but since he's been promoted he hasn't been allowed to he's do been it and I think that's the big, he's been reined in that's the big difference between the owners at ipswich and i had this conversation with ipswich fan the other day they haven't been delegate and forget they've been 
right buster that's how much money you got how you spend it is, we're not going to tell you to buy what to do how you spend it is that that's the budget zap yeah. there's been right. a better and there's I been think... a better control no ian there's been better control and his coach his young coach comparing Kieran oh McKenna that's that's got Eugene that's Holden got to, if, if he did it that's got to be his best ever signing that is in, in my book. all right ian i need to stop now um uh, i've, I've all got right. a I've got to think, look, we, we can, every, every episode we'll have of FBC until the Pearson situation gets resolved one way or another, whatever that other way may be, it's going to be a point of discussion. We're, you know, we're, we're still, if we'd have won last night, again, fine margins, we'd have been in the playoffs, although I think we might have just been about seventh looking at the league table this morning. But Dave, great to have you on. Ian, you'll be joining me whenever we record the uh, Cardiff Review podcast. Probably uh, Sunday morning, might even be Saturday, but we can talk about that offline. Thanks to everybody yeah. who's uh, who's who's listened, and uh, the number of people that are listening to every episode, absolutely fantastic. You know, it's nudging north of twelve hundred for every episode now. And Dave, always good to have you on uh, Thanks, today. Me. And Mark, who's uh, just uh, he's had to go off to uh, a meeting. Uh, but everybody, thanks a lot for listening, and we'll be back very soon. All the best, everyone. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Bye bye now. Cheers. Come last.